Good morning and uh, welcome to the beginning of the second annual Imago Day conference. Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, we have a special opportunity with the Imago Day conference to explore different facets of what it means to be uh, image bearers of the living God in our individual lives, in our culture, in our churches, and in the world. Um, as part of the conference, just an overview of what's happening, we'll have chapel today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, and there will, of course, be chapel credit tomorrow. Uh, we will also have a 4.30 p.m. Q&A in Mills 180 on culture and race with Reverend White. Um, after you hear him speak, you will want to come, um, but it's an opportunity. I'd like to encourage everyone to come. You will get chapel credit if you come, but to have an opportunity to sit with Pastor White, um, who has a unique experience, wisdom, and knowledge of this topic, um, he'll be able to bless us richly. So the opportunity to sit with him, please come, 4.30 today. Uh, tomorrow will be, uh, in addition to chapel, a concert in Carter Lobby at 8 p.m. with Nabil Lins. Um, yeah. Uh, I could not be happier uh, than to introduce this year's conference speaker, the Reverend James White. James is the senior pastor of Christ Our King Community Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. He also serves as the executive vice president of Orga organizational relations with the YMCA in the Triangle. Uh, in addition to pastoring in the YMCA, James is a speaker, he's a teacher, and he's a consultant, and he's going to be a great blessing to our community, and he already has been. He and his wife, Cynthia, have three grown children and live in Raleigh. Please give a warm Scots welcome to Pastor James White. I have much love for my brother here. Whenever we get together, I am blessed beyond words. Uh, and, and honestly, uh, I am here not because I don't have love for you, but uh, I'm here out of relationships. Uh, Leah as well, who is, uh, I am just a fan. We, we go way back uh, there in North Carolina. I am looking forward to being with you in these next few days. And man, could you all have given me a little bit better weather? Uh, it is cold, and, and a brother with a bald head, we don't do well <laughs> with cold, you know? So, man. Listen, um, one of the things for me, and, and, and I talked about this last time I was here, many of you probably do not remember, but, but whenever I come here, I have a moment, and that, that moment is because the, the words, look out Mountain Tennessee, are words that resonate with my soul because, again, those are words very much that I first heard when I heard Dr. Martin Luther King talk about let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain, Tennessee. And I've been thinking about that as we're going to have our time together as we're talking about the Imago Day. I've been thinking about that because I was thinking, how do I even want to connect and communicate with you uh, in our days together? And, and here's what I have decided. I I haven't been with you long enough, and this will probably be a chance for me to get to know you. I haven't been with you long enough, but one of the challenges I think that we're facing, especially institutions that have a solid biblical Christian worldview, is that we have a choice. Because institutions like this, and this institution, because of where you're positioned, up on a mountain, I mean, it is beautiful. I mean, driving up last night and seeing the lights and seeing the majestic beauty of the city and thinking of the historical uniqueness of this place. But I thought, and I just walked around briefly last night, and I don't think I was creeping or, or doing anything like that. <laughs> but I thought, this institution has a choice. Am I speaking to a group of Christ followers who are, at, who are in a fortress? That the comfort of Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, that they are, they're here at the top of this mountain, sort of cloistered away from the rest of the world, and they've got this wonderful Christian fortress to where their parents and others have sent them because it's a good school, theologically accurate, PCA, very much understanding reformed theology and theologically right, biblically sound, technically excellent. Is it a fortress where you can come and just hide away and move away from the rest of the wicked 
world? Is it a fortress to where you can protect yourself from the Oscars last night? Because I'm sure you didn't watch the Oscars last night. Or is this a place that's not a fortress, but it's a place that facilitates? Facilitates leaders who want to change the culture. Facilitate leaders who, instead of going to tweet out things about the Oscars and the fact that Moonlight won uh, and, and tweet out some of the dynamics of the LGBT community, rather than to somehow be against, will understand that the Oscars have always told us where the world really is in a wonderful way. And we as Christians sometimes move away. And, and before you think that, oh, we're getting on a cultural slide, isn't it fascinating that, that movies have always given us a picture of who we are? Did anybody argue when The Godfather won? Was anybody upset when the Oscar went to Silence of the Lambs? So I hope, rather than being against, you may go back and listen to some of the acceptance speeches and understand where our culture is. So I want to talk to you in these next few days uh, from the perspective of being a facilitator. And, and that's because, man, I'm probably going to say some things that will let you know I'm not on staff here. I'm not faculty here. Uh, I'm also probably going to say some things as well to let you know that, that I am, I'm, I'll be 56 this year. And, and one of the challenges with that is I've been married 30 years. Got a, y'all, my wife is fine. I'm telling you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, I just, y'all, y'all, look, 30 years and she's still fine, you know what I'm saying, 30 years, and, and, and 30 years, and, 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 and I go into my, my, my doctrinal reality comes to bear when I wake up in the morning, and, and when I see her, and I go, the sovereignty of God. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the grace of God. Only way a little short brother like me could pull a fine looking woman like her. Grace of God. <laughs> and then we have three adult children who I love, who it amazes me that my youngest is 22 and my oldest is 26. But when we talk about the image of God, it really starts very early. Thank you. The, the ladies are going, ah. Oh. Thank you, because I struggle with this image, because that's me, born in the country, Barco, North Carolina, enters into the world with, as parents, John and Eleanor White, John White, ship worker who, as well, John White, who was born in 1929. Eleanor White as well, who was born around that same time. And they gave birth to two sons. My mother was a school teacher. And my mother being a school teacher, again, born 1961, I had the privilege of journeying with her because she was the first African-American to integrate the school system. And, and that was a big deal because the local Ku Klux Klan threatened to burn a cross in our yard. And for those first few weeks, there were all sorts of threats. But then mom allowed me to become a part of that journey. And being a part of that journey, again, was very difficult because I grew up a fat kid. Now, it's one thing being from the country. That's difficult. And then in the 60s, being African-American, being black. But then I go, man, God, what are you doing? A fat kid. <laughs> A non-athletic fat kid who read books and who hung up. Well, thank you. May the fat kid club continue. <laughs> and, and this was I struggled with whether or not I'd show this to you, and <laughs> this was a real tough moment in my life because I couldn't play ball, and this coach, Mr. Green, who you see me kneeling beside, he, he said, James, would you help me do something? I need your help. I want you to be an assistant coach. 
And I'm thinking, oh, man, because see, fat kids love the rule. You know what I'm saying? When, when you have no leadership, you're excited. And, and little did I know that when he said be an assistant coach, it was an assistant coach of the girls' basketball team. News flash. It wasn't an assistant coach. It was a manager. Wow, that's all I need on my resume. Manager of the girls' basketball team. Fat kid, African-American, rocking the fro, as you can see. Uh, but... All of these things shaped me. All of these things had me come to grips that your story is very unique. But around the same time as I was growing up in my Methodist church, that at first I used to say was not a biblical church, but man, the older I get, the more I realize it was a redemptive gospel church. And I'll never forget hearing this passage of Scripture. It's in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and over the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I mean, man, wow. Hearing that, it was... It was just too good to be true. But then I also was a reader, a student, and, and wanted to be a lawyer and, and love government. And, and yet I heard some other words that echoed in my mind, even as a child. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Fundamental truths. But growing up, looking at our world, studying history, wait a minute, created in the image of God, and yet I'm in a country that says we hold these truths to be self-evident. Oh, absolutely. Founding fathers understood something about the Imago Day. Well, why in the world then is there, when I study the history books, was there 250 years of slavery? Why, why does it take the Supreme Court to sort of distort the image of God and come up with a support court case called Plessy versus Ferguson, which says separate but equal is important. And then it would take years later in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, to say that now we need to desegregate the schools. But then it didn't happen fast, and so it would take a Civil Rights Act in 1965 to somehow say that now we need to have equal access for all people who are created in the Omago Day in the image of God. But wait a minute, I thought the document says that we hold these truths to be self-evident. It's just evident in the way that God has created us that all men are created equal. What in the world is the problem? It was confusing, but it became even more confusing. If I'm doing this and it's not moving, I need your help. When I begin to look at these actual pictures, scars, Not just some liberal framework, not just someone trying to bring up things out of history that have no meaning, but there are actual scars that we can see. This past year, Alessia Cara said it this way, scars to your beautiful. She just wants to be beautiful. She goes unnoticed. She knows no limits. She craves attention. She praises an image. She prays to be sculpted by the sculptor. Oh, she don't see the light that's shining deeper than eyes can find. Maybe we have made her blind. So she tries to cover up her pain and cut her woes away because cover girls don't cry after their face is made. But there's hope. 
that's waiting for you in the dark. You should know you're beautiful just the way you are. And you don't have to change a thing. The world could change its heart. No, scars to your beautiful. We're stars and we're beautiful. Oh, 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 oh. She's voicing that even in the midst of this, there's scars to our beautiful. Why would it take laws to say that this was wrong? I look at this image and I go, wait a minute, they're actual human beings, people, and, and there are images in some where there were lynches, where there were children, where there were women that were present. How could this be a part of our world? But there's something about tragedy that, that exposes who we really are. Maybe there's something about tragedy that, that we need to look into that would help us understand that maybe there is something to this idea of implicit bias. Maybe there is something to our bias that we have. Maybe our brains work in a particular way that what should be evident is not evident. And maybe it takes tragedy, pictures that would make you want to look away to be able to see things clearly. And, and so this morning, you know what I'm beginning to realize is that maybe for us here in this room, because much of what I've talked about throughout history, the church is the one that gave theological definition for it. Because we came up with these crazy beliefs that the Bible didn't even say, that we as well practice that black people will curse. That we as well, even though we have the Bible that talks about the Imago Day, even though it's right there in Genesis, we somehow had to say that there were three-fifths of a person. And as well, even some of our theological fathers, our heavyweights that have shaped our theological framework, even many of those, Jonathan Edwards, incredible, but he was a slaveholder. I can't let him off the hook. Why? Because maybe there were some biases that were there that even he didn't realize, and maybe for us as well, but maybe it will take tragedy to help us see our biases. I want to take us to a tragedy. It's a familiar one. It was a first century lynching. Can I read for you this tragedy? Luke, the physician with the skill of a spoken word artist. Luke, the physician, writes in details that give us art and science all in the same space. And yet Luke, in, in Luke 23, would give us this story. Luke 23, beginning with verse 32, it says, Two others who were criminals were led away to put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide their garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he's the Christ of God, the chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, uh, coming up to him and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was also an inscription over his head, this is king of the Jews. But one of the criminals even who was hanging railed at him, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us too. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God? since you're under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed justly, that for we're receiving our due rewards for, for the deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, this day you'll be with me in paradise. 
See, see, maybe we, we've got to uncover our biases. When we, when we talk about the Imago Dei, it is complex, and yet maybe the problem of being created in the image of God, we can't even get there, can't even see it because we have biases. You know what uncovers bias? It's interesting. Tragedy has a way of uncovering our bias because there's pain. You begin to see how you're wired when there's pain. This is why the story of the Bible, the, the story is one that, that ends and that continues and that the celebration is one of pain. And you know what? I believe it's because God knows how we're wired because we don't even listen until there's pain. You really don't understand the worth of a relationship until she breaks up with you. You, you don't even know what it feels like until you're going through that. We learn more from the tests that we fail than from the ones. I, I know that is not a good thing to say because I know there's exams. But, but isn't it interesting? You learn more from the failures than you do your success. Maybe we're wired that way, that there's something about pain that should begin to change the way our minds are wired. Even science suggests that our bodies are wired, that there are hormones that are released whenever there is tragedy. Maybe, maybe what God is doing with us is trying to help us see maybe the cross should be so central in our lives so that, again, the tragedy would wake us up to how we're really wired. But not only do you see bias there, but there was even bias in this story when it came to power. The, the story says that the soldiers were mocking him. When I think of the soldiers mocking him now, everything that Mel Gibson has done, these are images from his movie, that it's not exactly, it's not biblically, it's more from an artistic display, uh, again, of this moment. But, but it does capture something here that is fascinating because these Roman soldiers, no way he can be a king because we're controlling him. No way. He's, he's not even taking wine to bear the pain. Maybe the power. Did you notice in this text, if you're the son of God, he saved others, he can't even save himself. Maybe this morning some of us are biased, because maybe Jesus isn't doing what you thought he would do your way. Maybe some of us can't even see our own biases because you've got the Christ of your imagination and not the Christ of revelation. Maybe we have to recreate Christ. Maybe some of us, and here's the danger that I think we're facing in our culture, some of us have given Jesus a political agenda rather than a biblical agenda that transcends any political framework. I would suggest to you, Jesus is far more conservative than any conservative can be, and he's far more liberal than any liberal can be. He puts us all to shame. As a matter of fact, he's not here to somehow take sides. He is the king of kings, lord of lords. He is the king. And our biases have come up and we've stopped talking because we've tried to reduce him to a political framework. They missed him. They, they didn't see their bias because he wasn't doing what he said he could do. And here's what happens. They had the illusion of control. For some of us this morning, we don't see who we really are or who he really is because we have the illusion of control. But I want you to think of one more thing. They have this defining moment. Talk about bias. You, you would think, you would think that this defining moment, again, would, would be interesting. And this last moment is fascinating to me. Even one of the guys who was guilty, he had his own bias. And some of us, when it comes to our bias as well, that, that even in our own moment, we can't see who he really is because it's not turning out the way we thought. Notice what he says. He says, look, if you're the save us too, well, well first of all, save yourself, but, but save us too. Help a brother out while you're at it. The last few thoughts, I want to focus on this one guy who has become my hero and helping me see my own bias, it was that other thief. 
That other thief gives us a solution this morning of being able to see clearly who we are, being able to understand who we are in the image of God. Look at what he says. He, he says the, the other one rebuked him, saying, hey, 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 what, what you doing? She rebuked him, saying, don't you feel God? We, look, before you talk about save yourself, uh, we under the same sentence. The only difference between us and him is we are guilty See, this morning, here's the first step. If we're going to see our bias, if we're going to have a different conversation than the rest of the world, here's where us, for us as Christians, we should be dramatically different. Here's why. The reason why we can talk about slavery, the reason why we should never talk about as though talking about social justice issues is some extra thing than the gospel. The reason why we can weigh in into unjust situations, here's why. We are guilty. The thief says, man, we deserve what we're getting. I got good news for you. No one in here is innocent. You're not that good. Quit trying to prove that you are good. Don't look. And here's the other thing, too. Let me just say this. If you are white, you're beautiful and white and created in the Imago Day. Don't try to be something. Look, don't try to roll up in here being all hard and everything. And you know you're from white, upper class, privileged suburbia. You know that. Look, you can turn your head backwards. You can love hip hop music. That's fine. But you are who God has made you. And I am black and beautiful as well. I am Asian as well. Whatever you might be, that's who God has made you. But don't try to act like you're not guilty. That's why don't take sides when someone is killed by the police. Mourn with the child that has been murdered. Because we all are guilty. He says, we're receiving what we deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he says something else to help you know he understood his bias. He, he says, and he said to Jesus, oh, man, this is where this guy does not get the credit that he deserves. He said to Jesus, look at what he says to Jesus. He said, can you remember me when you come into your kingdom. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, Jesus, even though you are stretched out, even though your flesh is ripped, brother, you are the king. You're the one who can do something about it. Can you remember me when you come into your kingdom? We always play this guy as having last minute faith. This guy has incredible faith because he's willing to talk to a Jesus whose hands are not going to become a nail. He's willing to say, Jesus, my hope is you, whether you change the situation or not. Can I just say this to this group of leaders? If you're going to facilitate change, we got to have a Christ who even it may look like that we are losing. Even we may not be winning the culture war. We don't have to do battle in the culture war to somehow prove that we can put the liberals in their place. That language should never be in our mouths because we say even though it looks like we're losing, we still win. This brother sees clearly. You are the king even though we didn't get what we said we can get. Even though things may get worse, we don't have to protect ourselves because he is the king. Now, I said I was going to keep it calm because I know y'all are not used to rolling like this in chapel. (laughs) Y'all might think I'm an angry black man. I am an angry black man. I'm angry because we don't see our biases in the very framework of what we believe the cross should have a, a different conversation. He says, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, is he still your king, even though you may go into an employment situation where you may not have a job coming out of college that normally was was guaranteed to you? Is he going to be your king, even though, yes, we will have a multicultural reality of the world that we're living in, and there's no longer going to be a majority culture that we're used to, and America is different than what it's ever been. And listen, America doesn't have to be great again because America can be greater than it's ever been because of who Jesus is. I'm not trying to go back to any place in history. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And here's what Jesus does that's so crazy. He responds. Truly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. 
Jesus, even in this moment, when this man deserves death, when this man is a thief, and I go, he doesn't even get a chance to go back and do the Zachariah thing and, and give recompense for what he's stolen. This isn't fair. God, you're going to give this guy with you in paradise? And this was so incredible for you and for me. It's why, man, God, help me see my biases. Because at the end of the day, it's not fair of what you're going to do in any of our lives. That's the strange reality of the gospel. And here's the beautiful thing. We get to be with him. You get to be with me. And that changes everything. And so this morning, scars to our beautiful. This morning, I am thankful for the scars. This morning, I don't know about you, but I'm on a journey of saying, hey, God, guess what? Expose my bias. Here's why. I don't mind looking weak. I don't mind us going in and serving. I don't mind there being mystery because this cross is mystery, but it exposes how I am wired that is not wired the way you have attended to. And because here's the beauty. You know why I know this day you'll be with him in paradise? Because here's the deal. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. So my hope for us is that when we think about the image of God, we've got an incredible Savior who tragically wants to rearrange our biases, who tragically wants to rearrange the way we think, who we do not have to run away from our history because our history becomes a wonderful future story that all of us can have. And I don't know about you, Yes, I've got stuff going on in my brain that I've said and done that I can't believe, but I've got a Savior who redeems me, who changes me, and I can't believe that as well. There are scars now to our beautiful. Let me pray for us. In a moment where it just seems like everyone else is running away from the hard, tough conversation. In a moment where we live in a time period where we don't want to admit there's some scars. We have a savior, we have a story that says there's tragedy. And that story alone, the cross, should cause all of us to begin thinking very different. Would you help, would you help us be the generation that has a different conversation? You are the king. You are the one who has sacrificed. You're the one who was, it sounds strange, you were lynched for us. And yet, it's something beautiful. Because you took our place. Would you help us to think very differently? Would you help us to have your mind? Would you help us to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds? Would, would you help us to let this mind be in us so that we too understand that there's some scars for our beautiful? God, thank you. Thank you that you took tragedy so that we could triumph and live out who we are as your image bearer. It's in the name of the scarred one who even when he rose, he still allowed there to be scars. And it's his name of the beautiful scars for us that I pray. Amen.